All right. All right, Coach Drinkle. So how are you guys handling the quarantine so far? And how's everything going? Along so far. Sorry, you cut out for a sec. We're we're plugging along. You know, we're uh all it happened when we were on spring break, so all the kids are were spread out and most of the coaches are as well. So um we're we're an adapt quick uh operation here pretty quick. So uh, you know, we're doing the same thing as everybody else. We're, we're trying to keep all the day-to-day -day operations as, as close to normal as possible. So from a recruiting standpoint, really the only thing we've been that's hampered us a little bit is obviously spring football. And then us on the road or the kids coming to campus. But other than that, pretty much business as usual. All right. You mentioned you guys are missing spring ball. So how are you guys kind of making that up? Um, are you guys meeting and all that? How's that going? Yeah, we're meeting uh, as an offense uh, pretty extensively getting into game planning. You know, we had quite a few staff changes after this past season. Um, so we're all just getting on the same page as far as like game simulations and okay. and scheme and all that stuff, game planning, um, and then meeting with the players as much as we're allowed to. But then that stops obviously this week because the kids uh, finals prep and things along those lines. Okay. That's good stuff. Well, Hopefully we have a we have a 2020 season. I think we will, but let's let's hope that happens. Um, I'll get into the next question. This is America. We're having football. I, it's going I down. There's no way we're not having football. Um, so, <laughs> Coach, what do you believe on offense, and what's your philosophy? And if you want, you can hit on how who helped influence that philosophy, and um, maybe go into that a little bit. Yeah. So, just philosophy wise, I'm very different. You know, I think. Uh, I've used this analogy before, but I think every great offense, there's certain things you have to do. And to get to that point, we all just use kind of different looking cars to drive to that same point. So, uh, you know, like a coach Munkin here and myself, we believe in the same fundamental things, but the offenses we've used in our careers to get there are completely yeah. separate looking. Like I never even went under center in like 11 years. I think it was before this past year here. So just uh, a couple things I think you have to do offensively things that I just believe in my bones. Um, I think that's a, that's a culture thing. It comes down to tough situations when you're playing in postseason or playing late in the season. The weather is usually not the best, at least up in the north, so uh, in the Midwest. So you're, you're going to have to at some point run it to win it. Um, I think people lose sight of the fact how valuable possession of the ball is. Just, I mean – I say it every year when I talk to the kids, but it's like you play to win. You win by having more points than the opponent. And the only way you can obtain points is possession of the ball. Yep. So in theory, there's just, I mean, there's nothing. Every time I talk on that, the older I get, the older I sound. You know what I mean? But it's just, right. it's so absolutely critical that if you can avoid turnovers and negative plays, if you just do that, you're better than every other offense that has turnovers and negative plays. Yeah, definitely. You think of yourself as a defensive coordinator. If the other team never turns it over and is always gaining some yards, that is a very, very frustrating thing. So as a result, you get more risky with your play calls and coverages, you know, your pressures. And um, I do think, uh, I think you have to carry volume uh, to keep yourself, you know, I've kind of made a shtick my career a little bit as far as like being like ultra simple and I think that's gotten I've probably overdone it to the point where people get misconstrued with that I think that that's saying I just do less uh, only and that's not really it um, I think you have to limit yourself to the where you're going to carry volume in your offense to whether pre or post snap I think it's really good if you're going to be like the offense I ran was a bunch of formations and unbalanced and trades and shifts and motions right so I could get to the same core you can also have success lining up one or two formations and then having a bunch of built-in answers with your play concept but i think your efficiency is going to really really suffer your efficiency and execution if you try to do too much in both before or after the snap or not enough before or after the snap um I think one of the other things too man is you just got to take the yards they're willing to give you right every defense is built a certain way uh, and you got to get a kind of feel for that defensive coordinator and his plan to defend you and then be able to, uh, you know, don't be very hard-headed, but take the yards they're going to give you. 
build around your personnel first. I think that is the most, the two things I think that are tied into personnel that are really critical to hit on is one is you build around your own personnel. Who are your best players? What do those kids do well? Yep. And then secondly, create personnel matchups within the game of getting your good players against not their best players as frequently as possible. So that way it's no, that's really, really important. And then you always have that balance between like need and want and be complicated, but or look complicated, but be simple. So those are just some of the things that I think really help great offenses and the stuff that I believe in uh, kind of function. It sounds like, and, and I've watched a lot of your uh, clinic tape um, and I've watched a lot of your film and it sounds like Army's kind of influenced of where you're going, but you still believe in some of the same stuff that, that you utilized in the past. And I think that's, that, that's great stuff. Um, so you believe more now in the and having answers pre and post snaps. Is that would you be? Would you say you're going more in that area than you are uh, with the motion straight? It, it cut out completely whatever you were asking me. If you got was, me now. Yeah. All right. So as I said it sounds like that Army's influenced you a little bit to where you're going to have answers pre and post snap. And I've watched a lot of your clinic tape, and it seems like like you said you utilize uh, motions, trades, and, and shifts, and all that. So it's. Do you, see, do you see yourself moving forward whenever you leave Army is to, to utilize the, the answers pre and post snap or what do you yeah. think? Most football wise about being here is like, what are the components of what we're doing here on offense that you can take with you? And we've got a real coach Davis, our offense coordinator has done a really good job as far as uh, there's a lot of, a lot of similarities between the culture plays and being able to run the ball and inside, but, there are some components of it between the uh, some built-in checks. They got it like here, we're really smooth with our check system and uh, condensed formations, different kinds of unbalance with, right. uh, you know, creating a three or four man surface on the other side. Um, so yeah, absolutely. There's some things where I, I was, you know, the whole time, every day we're covering stuff. I'm always thinking about how can I incorporate this? Right. And I had been running for sure. Yeah, it's, I've, I've coached in both of those systems, and both, I mean, both work. I worked as a student assistant. I worked out on Craig Candido. He played at Navy, and he ran the same system there, and then I've coached in the spread. And it's, it's pretty night and day how different the systems are, but they both are utilized well, and you can use well, and they both work. It's just, I mean, it's what you can coach. So it would be pretty cool to see you utilize both and be able to marry both can um, teach in the future. Um, next, I was going to ask, so – You've coached and led some explosive offenses. What makes you unique? Uh, a couple things. One, one of the things I think I do a really good job of is I, I'm, I'm able to limit myself. And I think that's the hardest thing to do. I talk about this constantly, but I think it's just the hardest thing to do right now in offensive football is where do you draw the line between all the good stuff that people are doing? Because it's, it's, it's a buffet of it. I mean, right. everybody's doing some really good stuff, but I'm, I'm willing to limit myself. Um, I'm, I've gotten, I've never drawn up a play in my life. Uh, my strength is not like overall, like play design. My strength is that I'm able to take some things, combine it to strip, to build a, a package and streamline the teaching process of it. So I think that's, that's one thing I've really tried to stay ahead of the curve on is to try to really be the most uh, efficient and effective at the way that you teach the game, uh, and the scheme to people. Um, and as a result, um, that makes us very effective at like removing variables that can happen. You know what I mean? Like, what if they do this or what if they do right. that? You can, you, know, you want to have the answers on the front end. Um, I think one thing that's, that's helped out a lot, uh, you know, offensively with the stuff I've it is that there is a insanely strong correlation between practice and games. Not only like what we're calling, but with the situations that we're calling it in. Um, we've gotten very, very good at that. Uh, another thing is that I'm really unique with personnel groupings. One of the things I do that I would encourage anyone who's listening to this to do is if you're an offensive guy, talk to at least three really good defensive coordinators every year. Um, find out what they're doing that, that's helping them build their game plan, how they're – or how are they finding tendencies. You can build in a lot of your own answers to do that. So as a, as a result, I'm very unique with my personnel groupings to, so that when I line up in a formation with a certain amount of people on the field, I have access to 100% of my playbook. I think that's very important. 
Um, the other thing we do, just a real smooth job of organically incorporating tempo change. You know, when people talk about tempo, I don't even see it as the word tempo. I see it as rhythms, the rhythm of which your offense executes and how they do that. And I think if you can go back and forth really seamlessly uh, between them, I think that gives you an enormous advantage. Now, is that, is that based on feel for you in game of what tempo you want to utilize and, and the rhythm that you're calling plays? Or I've done it both ways. I've been really, been really slow with like trade shifts and motions. And I've gone, gone a couple, another year where I went nothing but like as fast, breakneck fast as you can. And what I've kind of settled on is that I think it's like a really good pitcher. If you, if you only do one thing all the time, some of the hitter catches up at some point. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if you have variety, so I, I think of it like this, is that I think you can carry three kinds of ways to change tempos throughout. I think that's really good. But the way I became a much better player, um, or Jeff Gersh, who's the head coach at Angelo State. He was the DC when I was the when I had my first OC job at St. Ambrose. And, and it was kind of like the way I saw it was like, all right, dude, my job was to score points. Your job was to stop them from scoring points. Like, there's not real like, and then when you become a head coach and you're like, eh, all I really care about is winning, then I became much more effective. So when I when I start a drive, I think about the 11 kids that are playing defense in the game. And I think on their body while it gives me an advantage. So when I start a series, I want to make sure that my defense has time to meet and hang out and talk to each other and see the trainer and get ready to go. So as a result, I'm going to have to go slower. Well, if I'm going to go slower, that means I need, the kids that are playing defense, I want to attack their brains. So I'm going to do a bunch of formation things, formation of the boundary, trade shifts, motions. That's good. Shifts, all, ki all kinds of stuff. But at some point during the course of the series, by the end of it, I want to attack the transition to get out and make those guys have to go faster and run number to number. So there's some of those things that I, I carry, like, I guess, inherently as I'm calling the game that I put a lot of thought into. Um, and then the last thing is that, uh, you know, I think one of the things I do a really good job of or that I have in, this, in the past is just balancing what you need to do to win versus what your players can actually execute. You know, there's times where it's like, hey, yeah, I, you know, inside, I got all these inside zone plays. So there's some of that stuff of like being able to limit yourself that even though I've got all this stuff on the call sheet and it all looks great, man, there's, there's times I can do less to get more. Right. Um, I know you talked a little bit um, about in, your install um, before we get into your base, your base run and passing RPO and all that, um, what install process has worked uh, best for you? Um, and what's it look like? Maybe, I mean, does it take you two, three days? I know it takes guys seven days. Um, how's yours look? I'm pretty much all the way through six, uh, but I get about 85. Eh, probably 80% is probably better. So the other thing I would recommend doing is, is, again, like I sit down and install the whole thing with the defensive coordinator. So we're putting the same things that make sense to be in against each other. You know, if they're going to be putting in a six-man pressure and playing a ton of man and you haven't installed in any of your man stuff or your protections or ways to move the pocket, you want it to be realistic for both. I think if, you're, if you can become a really good football team, if you and the, de the defense coordinator and the We're going to install this because it can be mutually beneficial for us to either execute or to learn from. So I think when you like day one, you got to build your foundation. This is who we are. These are the things we're going to do. Then from there, you go from the foundation stuff to hey, this is situ. These are the things that need to go in situationally. Um, then you cover like the rest of your packages from there. So if you have like variants within a play um, and our auxiliary uses of it. And then you carry very things that are, then you install last things that are very specific to a situation like uh, we own point play or something along those lines. So if you can do that kind of based on the foundation situations, the, the supplementary ways you can run it and then down into your, your specific situations. Again, it's same thing for the defense. They're not going to get in there you know, a six-man defensive line right. look to, to do everything. So I think just the more you can figure that out, the better off you are. 
Yeah, it's that's a really good point. I, I've I've coached in some systems where we're running stuff on offense that really doesn't make sense for what's being installed on D, and it's just it looks ugly. Um, how many days did you say it took you? I think you cut off when when you're talking about how many days. Six. Six days. Okay. Six. Right. I'm through everything in six, but uh, but really the first three. Uh, 90% of it's in through the first three. Okay. Um, and I'm a big believer, like, the reason it's through three is that I don't think you can install day one and then immediately jump in to install the second practice. Right. You have to clean up and address some of those things and, and adjust personnel or whatever it is. So you want to have a bump. It's easy to learn. So you can be front heavy with the install. I think you're better off in the long run. Yeah. And then – um, best teaching for you, do you go uh, board, film, practice, or is that how you do it, or do you do any differently than that? Every way possible. I try to really hit every learning style there is. So, like, in our – my playbook is all done digitally. So, a kid gets, like, a general overview of, like, what the play is, why we have it, when it's used. Okay, then it's got written out assignments. Then it's got um, diagrams video of everything that it uses and then we will always physically walk go through what we call teach periods and go through and physically move through it before they actually are, are asked to do that and we do a lot of it even then the next step of it I guess is would be like uh, we do a lot of full speed stuff but segmented so it might only be two position groups together before we actually go all 11 on 11 to actually run it gotcha that's good stuff now, talking after talking install, I know we. I was gonna have you write or um, talk about your base um, run and pass. I know you, you got a presentation, so if you want to maybe pop that up and maybe start going over some zone stuff, you're more free than welcome to. Yeah, so I picked some zone stuff just because I wanted to. Uh, I wanted to have something that has a lot of carry over to everybody in their offense. So I wanted to show uh, kind of what I do and how I do it. It's a very. Uh, are you able to see that now? Yep. Yep. It's all good here. Okay, really easy process, and I'll show a couple clips of each one, but what I call um, my man scheme, because it's really, it's not really zone, it's more closer to what the NFL guys are running is what looks like duo, yeah. uh, as opposed to inside zone. So the way we do it is we set a point. So this, the, there's some variance you can add into it that's really easy. So we assign all the blocks by number. The center always has zero in the count, so he's able to set the point with whoever he says, and then you just count laterally from those blocks. Okay, so the center, guards are always blocking ones, tackles are always blocking two, super backs or, or fullbacks and tight ends are always blocking three. And then it's really a simple process. If your guy's a down lineman, you base block him. If your guy's a level two defender, that means you're either covered or under. You're uncovered. You step at your guy. You step at your assigned man. No big deal. If you're covered, you go through that guy on your way to your man. So it works out like this: that we're no matter what front you draw in, the center is going to have the point or the zero. Guards count one and tackles block two. So the minus number, the negative numbers, uh, tie into us who's front side, who's back side. So. We have a four-play series. So if we're going to run any of these main, it doesn't matter. It's still three linemen for three linemen or three linemen for the three gaps, however you want to do it. I add variance into how we're going to handle the back side of the play. So you got to think about it like you really, are, you know, in a spread offense, you're building it based on six gaps, ABC on one side, ABC on the other. And you have a bunch of five or six man run concepts. Okay. So on our full zone stuff, this is our, you know, our, our signature, signature physical downhill play. We're blocking everybody. Um, and we're so that's going to put the backside defender is going to be blocked by a fullback or tight end. So there's, if anyone wants to pause this, there's the assignments for it. And there's how it's drawn up. So we're counting everybody in the, in, in the count. So nothing ever changes on the front side. And on the back side, we're counting everybody, and minus three is blocked by a, a soft tight end or a hard tight end wherever he's at. Zone read tells us it's the same thing for everybody. It's just that minus three on the back side, we're not going to block him. We count everybody, but we skip minus three. So I can have, again, in this picture with the under front, I could have a hard tight end. doesn't matter where the guy's coming from. 
Doesn't matter if he's swiping all the way back, starting as a soft tight end in the backfield, a second back in the backfield, like a split back. Doesn't matter. It just tells whoever normally would block that guy to we're, we're going to skip him and block him in the count. We run a zone trap play that's been very successful for us. So that's going to remove the D tackle from the count. Now, again, nothing on the front side changes. But for us, we're going to skip the big guy in the count. So that means the backer count would be one and two on the backside or wherever the point is. We're going to skip the down lineman and block the other two. So the first man backside of the point is the trap guy. Correct. For okay. First down lineman backside of the point. Okay, yes. And then the last one we run is zone ISO, which is the first guy backside that's at level two. We skip him in the count. So that always puts the guard on what they're counting is one and two, one and two, one and two, over and over and over again. It just tells them, hey, everybody. If we're running zone read, count everybody. If we're running zone trap, don't count the D line. If we're running zone ISO, don't count the backer. Okay. And that tells us uh, how to fit everything up off of that. So I've got some some snaps of that. And I do have a question before you move on to some film. Yeah, um, but color wise, I, I've seen some of your your um, clinics in the past. You've talked a little bit of color. Is there a reason you're doing red, yellow, and green and blue? I know you've talked about that a little bit. Is there a yeah, reason? Just so uh, it's, it depends on the scheme. I cut it down so they get the color aspect of it. So. Hey, hold on real quick, Matt. You're, hold on real quick. Your uh, doesn't sound good. Hold on. So I, I incorporate the color schemes to help me out or to help the players out with just understanding assignments. So the, the red is always the point. The yellow is always the one in the count. And the blue is always the two in the count. So it's just a, it's just an easy little way for us to have to, to incorporate it with uh, a responsibility or an assignment. Okay. Um, if you want to go over a little bit of film um, with some inside zone, that'd be, that'd be great. You bet. Uh, let's see. I think this is it. Yep. Okay. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna be able to rifle through some of these. Yeah, no problem. So for us, this would be. An example, now I'll do, you'll see in some of this, I do a lot of stuff with uh, fly sweep action. So I'm a big power read team, counter tray read, uh, fly sweep with inside zone opposite. So here we're going to be running our inside zone play. So we're going to set the point. We've set the point as the play side A gap defender. So that gives us assignments across the board. And the thing I, one of the things I like the most about it is that we don't ever have to say a word. Okay, we don't have to make a series where the play is going. Um, so it's a very simple process. So if your guy's a down lineman, you're going to step at and base block. If your guy's a level two, I'm covered. So I'm going to go through and up. I'm going to go through and up because I'm covered. So it's an easy look uh, at those, those that set of blocks. Now what we coach the, sh the heck out of with the back is uh, the back doesn't move till the quarterback catches the snap. He's going to read the first down lineman call side of the center. That's his read. His track is the call side leg of the center. And his job is to press until he hits heel line of the O line and then bend. So we talk a lot about, um, uh, about making those cuts, uh, we, like at the, never using the term cut, basically bending like how you were. So here we're playing against a 30 and running to a two-man surface. I'll talk about this here in detail, but um, just an 11 personnel, three by one, um, that we're able to get uh, sprung loose. But I wanted to talk about the difference between running versus a 30. You gotta have to understand in a spread offense, let's say you're gonna use a six-man concept, you have to account for the seventh guy somehow. So if I'm running the ball with a two-man surface, we're gonna set the call side backer as a point, which makes minus two, minus three, okay? And then this becomes your seventh defender. So as a result, the center is gonna be, my guy's level two, but I'm covered, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on, I'm through and up and I'm on. So that, that part of it's easy. And then to me, you got three options with what you're gonna do to the seventh guy, okay? 
You have to do something with a formation to remove him. That's option number one is, is getting some kind of formation where he has to detach and walk away from the box. Two is you can block the guy. Or three is you can conflict him. And that, that means in my brain either you RPO off of that guy or you use some kind of motion, fly sweep motion at him to help control him. So, uh, uh, again, running at the two-man surface, that's a different deal than running at the three-man surface, which I, sh I should have a clip up here in a sec. This is just a standard uh, four-man front, so we're going to set the nose to the... You can see it's a, it's, it's, it's a very, very vertical downhill play. Okay, here, here's running it. This is an 11 personnel two by two, and this is a great look at running it at a three-man surface. So when you're running it at a three-man surface, we're able to, you can you do it one of two ways, either add a tag to it or change the name of the player or whatever. But we now want to set the nose as a point. So what that's doing is it's essentially saying we can account for four front side defenders instead of three. So now the center would take this, the guard has one, tackle has two, tight end has three, and backside minus one, backside minus two. So this guard right here, I can help with that four eye on my way to that backer. I can take the two, I'm out on the, the uh, number three in the count. I can help on the two eye or the four eye, and I can help, and I, I base block. So what that does is when you have the, the variety, and then again, the seventh defender is that one that's out there, he's late. Is that allows you to really, really have, give those three, four tight front teams a hard time with their fits when they want to rock back and when they don't, because if they're keying guards or keying backfield mesh, with which way the quarterback opens, you can put those guys in a bind in a, in a, in a hurry. The other thing I like about changing up is like right here, the center is one on one, but the center is blocking the run key. So all he has to do is step and chase hands, and that clearly makes the decision for the back. It makes it a very, very easy process for him. That's a that's a decent look at like all the uh, the inside zone or the duo stuff for us as far as how the count system works. Let me find a zone read in here. So now all that tells us is we're going to skip the three in the count. So one thing I didn't talk about with the count, if they're ever stacked like this look right here, so level two and level one are stacked, we count top to bottom. Okay, so that would be the point. That would be one. That would be two. That would be minus one. Oh, so I was saying I'm on. I'm through on my way. Base, 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 up. There's three, so we skip him and block most dangerous man. So you can tell, like, obviously that H back, it doesn't matter if he's actually attached or a soft tight end or was a second back coming from the backfield. I got a question for you, Coach, in this, in this scheme here. So you talked about when, yeah. they're stacked, when they're stacked play side, why do you guys identify the second level defender? Top to bottom? Yeah, why do you, why do you guys do that? Otherwise, like, just because one is that the level two guy can change really, really easily. So by counting him on the backside, it, it forces you to, let, let's say we we're running it the other direction because you're running the same problem. So let's say we want to run the inside zone this way. We've set him as the point, him as one, him as two. On the backside, we, didn't want, we don't want to set him as one and him as two because then that combo is going to be screwed up and they'll hang on to it longer. Yeah. So if we set that as that's much more likely to happen, which I can often go through and up and stay. So it just it, it fits the natural flow of the play a lot easier. That makes sense. Okay. But that stack stuff happens all the time. So like right here, you're going to see it. The other thing about using the number system is that it's really easy to pass off line stunts in games like this because you can just hammer and wall back. So that's, this is a great look at the left guard. So the point is the nose. That makes him one and two. Yeah. On the back side, it's minus one. I'm sorry, minus one. I have to work up to level two, but I am uncovered with that four eye. 
So he steps at his defender because of four eye, we should be able to win any one-on-one block, you know, at least to cover the guy up and get a sit. Right. And the last one kind of I talked about was that zone trap deal for us. So now with the same count system, we're just removing the big guy from the count. So now we're going to run the ball to the right. We set him as the point, one and two, nothing changes. He is out of the count, which makes him one and him two. So now I can go guard, tackle, and we bring the H back to trap on the D tackle. I do prefer this play that you can run it any way you want. You, I do prefer running it to the nose and trapping a three. I think it's just an, it's an easier deal for the back. The other thing you can do is when you do it to a 3-4 team, it's awesome because whether you run it to a two-man surface or a three-man surface based on your count, you can change between the nose and the four eye who you want. Here we're going to run to the right. We're not counting the D-tackle on the left. It's a great play in short yardage. Goal line uh, scenarios where guys want to get up and, and try to get vertical through the field. It stops fast play real fast. That's good stuff. It's awesome. You can see how you can see just right here what it does as far as puncturing holes and getting everybody on levels. So you get fits on the level two guys really easy, and it creates some artificial seams right away. So this isn't one deal I run all the time, but it's a very handy situation for me. So it's it's your quick hitter is kind of what you're telling me. But teams that have fast D linemen. What's that? I say this is this is your quick hitter is what you're you're trying to tell me. Yeah, and it's just I mean it hits the same uh, uh, pretty much the same rhythm as an inside zone, but it just like I said, look what this does to the four eye back here who's walking out to a five. That tight end, the tackle's arcing, so it widens him to begin with. Then he's not engaged, and then he's so far up the field and caught, it puts him in a tough spot. Man, so that's really kind of the gist of it. Was that was that to a three four just now? We rolled that cut up. So, was that to a three four? That last clip there. Uh, it was like an under front. Was it? I closed out. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. No, you're good. Um, if you want to talk uh, your pass real quick, you don't have to go too far into depth if you don't want here. Your base pass. Yeah, it's actually. It's, uh, it's uh, hang on. Let me close this sucker here. Maybe talk about Q progression if you want. Yeah, you bet. That's a lot of guys are looking for that. Am I sharing this right now? Nope, I do not see it. I see okay, it now. Yep, there you go. Okay, I'll buzz through this quick. You're good. Okay. So, um, I have a very unique drop back passing system. Uh, it's problem high school teams, um, but it's very versatile for what we do because it's a good fit. So I teach everything as two-by-one concepts. So I'm a big two-back team, and even when I'm in detached, like what looks like four wide or, or 11 personnel, I, I still always count two positions on the offense as backs. So as a result, I'm, everything I do is two-by-one. And then our backs are never part of the concept. So I have X, Y, Z that are true receivers. And the progression I use is all color-coded. So I'm going to talk about our spacing concept, which is all-purpose. I carry this into every single game no matter what. Um, and I don't know if we're going to talk about game planning later or not, but the, the, I carry this in every single week. Okay, so what this is, is there's a, there's, so I teach everything as a two-by-one. So this isolated receiver by himself runs the vertical, uh, and then the two guys that are together run what I call a tube and a cork. So a tube is like a conversion vertical, and a cork is a curl or a corner. The backs are always working to the flat. So what I do is I teach as a full progression or sweeping progression. So I have everything done as color code like a stoplight. So uh -huh. green means that is your pre-snap progression. If you can't get green, you go to yellow. You don't get yellow, you go to red. So you just start. It tells you pre-snap is a vertical. Our spacing concept is a vertical and an out. Now that out changes by an arrow, a swing, a bubble whatever depending on the formation but you're running that you're reading that leverage week so if they match us two for two we probably have leverage to be able to catch the ball and trigger it out there right away if it's two two defenders out here and they're soft we probably can just catch it throw the ball to flat take our six yards and be done with the play if they're up pressed we got a great shot at a one-on-one -on -one vertical uh, with no help over the top there's over our two weak side that tells us before the ball's ever even snapped, that part of it is dead, 
and I immediately go yellow, red, check down. So it, it's a it's an easier deal for us because if they put three over on over our two, we should be one guy uh, to an advantage on the backside. So the quarterback checks leverage weak, and then if you think about the, the a dice the side of a five, that's really what this concept is. You got the high and low on this side, the five spot in the middle, and then high and low on the other side. So it's a very, very easy situation for us. And it matches no matter what we get in. So like this is a 20 personnel look. Personnel look. This is a uh, an 11 personnel look so I can get the back out early. Here's a 10 personnel two by two look. Uh, and an 11 personnel with a nub. So this is the only time it changes. Is, is It's kind of like old sandbox rules in the sense of uh, we want that vertical part of it caught on the numbers. So if you're ever the vertical component by a, a nub tight end like this, you have to cut, you have to run a corner route to get to that spot. But it's just all the same principles. And really, I mean, if I'm being totally honest with you, I'm getting in this and calling it so I have more space to throw it to different kids back on the field. So what I do is I build my formation family uh, to match the so I'm able to uh, get different kids running different parts of the route. So here's a look at us running it. You can see we've got outside, like clearly outside the hash, what I call defending the perimeter. This guy's an in-the-box defender. Two over two. So we should be able to be able to catch that thing and get a good shot down the field at a one-on-one -on -one throw, a high a, a low maintenance throw. Now, I'll map the hell out of all the protections and window dresses, so you'll see guys leaving all over. Here's one of my favorite things with protection. So people that want to, like, pattern match and combo uh, out of cover four or man coverages, this is a great look for us where they have three defenders, and the quarterback's going to be able to sweep back. But the problem is with that motion, it's really confusing to kids on defense who becomes two and who is three. Because when we snap the ball, he was three. Now he's number one, and it takes one kid to make to hesitate for half a second. So the tube route is really easy. The tube route is I push vertical two yards inside the hash for 12 yards. If I can be open by continuing to run, I will do that. If I'm not, I sell down and hook up anywhere I want between the hashes. And the curl, the corner route is all, or the cork is always going to run a curl unless he's got. So this is a scenario where he probably aligned early and saw that that guy was uh, going to be pressed and cut his split down some. So you end up with a vertical and a corner out, which are very high percentage throws versus cover two and, and man, which would be those scenarios that we give it back. Marriott, like I said, with different protections. There's a great look at hey, you, hey, two I over don't three. See, I don't see your film. I see your uh, PowerPoint here. Oh, God. Yeah. Pull up, pull up the film. I got to do that over, don't I? It's all right. No, no. All right. Just go over a couple. So when you, when you do the share, I have to switch. There you go. Okay. I clicked you on the wrong one anyway. Well, You're good. You just awesome. go a couple. Stop share. Share screen. It's got to be that one, right? There it is. Okay. Sorry. No, you're good. You got it now? Yep, all good here. Okay, awesome. So here's a look of us running this out of three by one, where we don't count the in-the-box defender. So they put two over our two. So this gives us a great leverage throw at the vertical or flat. And we're able to get by them and go. So again, a, a low maintenance, low risk throw with a good pre-snap read. This is what I, uh, I mentioned, different protection, so I'm able to get the back out. So here they're matching, they have four defenders out over our two-man side, so we know pre-snap we wanna go back side, but some of this ghost protection stuff where you can get the back out, excuse me, really helps out against cover four and cover one teams and, and zero teams, any kind of man coverage or pattern match because one becomes three becomes one. And it takes a moment of hesitation by somebody to go. Now that the 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 paired side, the two routes coaching points are 
you scream down the field two yards inside the hash. If once you get through 12 yards, you make the decision, if I can keep running and be open, I will do that. If not, I will hook up anywhere I want between the hashes. And the backside cork is always going to run a curl unless he's got then he's going to run a corner route. So what that does is that gets you the marker last. It gets cover two, cover four, uh, cover zero teams, which are the scenarios that you're going to run into pretty frequently uh, when you want to get away from the front side of the concept. I'm trying to find some here. So this is a great look down here at the bottom. They've got three defenders over R2. So he's going to now, and that safety's close. So if that safety, which he does stay over here, opens the side. So now he immediately goes to the middle, and he's ready to sweep back and trigger the ball. You know, we had in the seven years I've been running this pass concept, our quarterback's been all American. I've had four different kids be all American at quarterback because I think one of the benefits of this is it's very, very simple to our kids. So you can look at the helmet stripe. He checks to confirm that that safety is staying over there, and then you can see him move to the middle of the field, and he's ready to trigger the ball before that tight end ever gets there. And he made the decision he wanted to hook up and wait. It's a vertical ball. So here, here's a great look pre-snap. They put two over two. We get jammed up and don't get a great release, so he immediately comes to the middle of the field, and there's no help over the top, so you're able to give a, a man beater and a wiggle, you can see the quarterback check, saw the jam, and immediately comes back to the middle. Uh, I'm trying to find him where he sweeps, sweeps all the way back here. I think high school great coaches. One. I think high school coaches are really going to love the green, yellow, and using it as a stoplight for progression. I think that's something really simple, and and the high school co coaches can really adopt. In half the progression is done before the quarterback catches the snap. You know. Right. Yep. So here's a great look at. They've got three over R2 to the, to the two-man concept. We then look. He comes to the middle of the field, and we're bracketed and covered. He could maybe drill the two curl route in, but for whatever reason with the protection, he wanted to get the ball out, so he's able to use those backs as a swing route. So to me, that's why backs are so valuable. If you can put them out the flats a lot, because they stretch open windows for down-the-field receivers. They can help and protect. They help hide protection. They can chip on defense. Tailback has the ball out in the open field, and we're in pretty good shape. Um, there's a great look at us that they've got four over R2, so he comes over to the tube route, and the tube route always makes it right. Um, that's a great job with the tube route here. Again, they have three over R2 and really open four over two. So they have to be short to the backside. So he sees that safety camped out pre-snap pedaling. Rather than the quarterback, they would trigger the ball to him uh, before he's even really even ready for it. Great look at a, a vertical route covered two by two. I need to find one where we sweep all the way back here. Give me. So here they match and open three by three. We sweep back. There's a great look at it. So this is how the full sweeping progression works. He knows pre-snap. He doesn't even have to look over here. He's eyeballing the tight end, and the tight end is bracketed behind and above. So he then takes the curl around and drives that in. And again, you can see like it's not a very complex read, and it's not a very complex throw. And that's really the gist of that spacing route without boring everybody to do that. No, that was great. That's good stuff. That's, I think it's a concept. And, again, that's a concept that I can translate to the high school level. And I think um, using the stoplight colors is, is something a lot of high school coaches are going to love. Um, and then going off, yeah, of no that, doubt. going off of that, maybe as we finish here, talk about what do you look for in film when, you, when you're breaking down a defense? Um, maybe how do you play in red zone? And then uh, maybe some in-game adjustments, and that's what we'll finish on today. Yeah, you bet. Um, am I sharing anything? Nope. Okay. So, um, in regards to 
game planning and red zone. There's a couple things that we uh, that I, I think I, I do that are very, very unique that are very helpful. So I think week to week, you want to have as much play carryover as possible. So that way, if you if you can teach conceptually, it really doesn't matter what you're going to get scheme wise. Just because someone's seen something on film from you, uh, or that you've seen it from them, doesn't necessarily mean that's what you're going to get during the course of the game. So if you can have as much, figure out a way to get as much carryover as possible, I think that's huge. So I think what you want to do is you carry the same, a lot of the same plays, but you get them into the best looks. Now the best looks might be scheme wise, like hey, if I line up in this formation, this is how the or it's the best matchup. You know, uh, you know, for example, if people play like a strong side or weak side defensive end, and you can trade the tight end and then run away from their good player all the time, that, that to me that's a, a matchup issue more than it is a scheme thing. Um, you know, our game week is very, very unique. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll explain this like it's a, a you know, a Saturday game. So you play Saturday. I always think about the whole purpose of this. I always go back to what are you practicing for? You're practicing so your kids execute and play well in the games. And if you ever lose sight of that, I mean, I mean you're, you're beating your head against the wall. So what I do is we play Saturday. We come in Sunday morning for about two hours. We review a couple plays from the game, lift, run, and do a very basic, here's a two front and back page preview of the opponent we're going to play. The, the basic identity of who you are. Right. Um, and then they have all day Monday completely off. And then Tuesday, we do a helmet-only 45-minute long practice. And what that is is that uh, special teams install, and that's 10 minutes of their ba base offense and defense. This is their base front. This is their base coverage. Here's the, you know, is there anything new we're going to do this week, which almost never is the answer. So what that does is that maximizes all, all the kids that appeared in the game that are going to play in the next game week recovery to get prepared and their bodies ready to go. The other thing it does is it gives you as coaches a lot more time to come up and solidify a game plan. So what that does is that leaves me to Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday every week. So I have a three-day teaching progression. So on Wednesday, I've got all my dudes back that are healthy that are going to actually be playing in the game, which turns out practicing with the guys that are going to play is an important deal to winning, in my opinion. Yeah. So. No, <laughs> I, mean, how, I mean, most people miss the front end anyway. Uh, so Wednesdays is a day one. This is, hey, this is our base plays and pass. This is our base plays versus their base front and base coverage. And we're going to get two hours long. The Thursday practice or the day two practice. Now we're going to adjust it. It's still going to be full gear, but probably about hour and 45. And this is going to be, okay, situationally, this is how their base stuff changes. So if it's a super and long yardage, or if it's a first and tens or a blitz downs, whatever, this is how their base defense changes. This is what forces it to change based on situations. And then the third day, it's about an hour long, and it's in shell speed. And what this is, is this is more situational football, like you, you got greased up your red zone, your goal line, just so peak, anything you have to normally do that adjust to the space, uh, condensed space, we do that. And then any, like, double moves, uh, odds and ends, uh, things along those lines that you didn't get to during the week. So we really stick to that. And then the other thing I think we do that's extremely intelligent is that we do not practice the same way in September that we do in November. Uh, because we have so much play carryover, we're able to do, since we're not putting so much on the kids mentally every week, we're able to save them physically. So all those times get adjusted way down to by the time we're in the practice is about an hour and 20 minutes. The second one probably about an hour and five. And the third one's probably about 45 to 50 minutes. And we're able to go faster through everything because the kids have so many banged reps at it. Uh, you're able to do that. And as a result, their bodies are fresh. Their right. legs are fresh. Uh, more time in treatment, more time for recovery. So um, 
really that's that, that's kind of the game week. And then, um, you know, as far as once the game starts, some a couple things as far as like in game things that you look I look for early. I don't ever script anything. I don't believe in that. I don't. I've never understood it. I talked to a million people about it because I thought I was an idiot because I was like the only one who doesn't do it. But I don't get it. Like if you get off script and you're not on the script, then what's the point of doing the script? Now, if you, I guess in my brain, what I'm doing is the same thing as what other people do. So there's why you script is during the first series of the game. I want to see how they adjust to certain motions, shifts, a defending three by one detached, like what looks like ten personnel or eleven personnel with a nub tight end, um, and how they handle some of those things. Um, and how they handle tempo. So I, those are really some of the pieces I want to look at because I want to find out are they defending the field, are they defending the run strength, are they going to defend a pass strength. And it, once I have those, that allows me to go back into my, you know, know some of the things that structurally they should have a hard time defending from a number standpoint. And then what I'll do during a series, we don't really make like any adjustments per se, yeah. to like power is power, inside zone, right. inside zone. I will or during a series, I'll tell someone on a headset, hey, jot, you know, like the guy in the box usually, jot this down and remind me about this either next series or remind me about this on the next third and short or remind me about this in the red zone. So we kind of just put in reminders of things that we're able to discuss either during a series or, or when the defense is on the field of, hey, remind me, write down the scenario the next time we're in this scenario, which is either a next series down a distance or, or goal line red zone situation. So that's really as far as in, the in-game stuff. And then the other thing that I just think a lot of coaches, I don't think, I'm trying to think of a politically correct. Coaches, I think a lot of times drastically underestimate how much positivity can do. So I have a rule that once, once we're out on the grass, like do whatever, argue all you want about plays in a meeting room or classroom, the second we're all on the field together, it doesn't matter. You have to communicate positivity at all times. That's with your mouth and with your body. Because if you're, you know, if you're in a foxhole with somebody, it doesn't matter anymore. Yep. You better be positive and you better fill that guy next to you with hope so he thinks he's valuable and he thinks he can get the job done. And it's the same thing that once we're out on the gridiron, man, just be positive and make people think that they can do it. Uh, you know, give them a false sense of hope and, and go. You know, so I think that's a that's one thing I think a lot of coaches, it's easy to lose sight of because everyone's so competitive. But, boy, does that go a long way. Not, I think that's an outlier. I think I think that happens, the arguing piece, I think that happens a lot more than, than people think. And going back um, – I, I know a lot of coaches are going to want to know this answer, and I know I do as well. Halftime adjustments. So, how, how do you handle halftime adjustments? Do you guys watch film halftime wise and make adjustments, or how do you guys do that? You know, we, we you know, kind of meet as a, as a staff out on the field uh, and then hustle in to cover what we're going to, co- you know, talk about any like big picture stuff. Uh, and then I talk to the trainer to make sure, find out if there's anybody banged up that can't come back or has any limiting issues. And then I'll go meet with the all- and I'll say, hey, listen, so-and-so's leg is banged up, so we're not going to – her shoulders hurt. He's going to keep playing, but we're not going to do these things to the left. My plan – here's what they were doing in the first half. Here's my plan on how we're going to attack them in the second half, make sure that some of the things that we're doing right. So, uh, really, it's just kind of give everybody a, a – a, paint a broad picture for what the rest of the game is going to entail uh, and what we're going to need to do to win. And then, again, just to kind of calm them down and make them feel like they're very well prepared – uh, for that situation, this game, and we've got them right where we want them, no matter what the scenario is. Yeah. You know, if you're losing, you can spin that really easy of, hey, we played as bad as we can, and we're really close. And if you're winning, it's forward, you got to, you know, so you can adjust it from coach talk that way. But really just that overwhelming broad picture, big picture thing, uh, very, very little specifics, and we never change, make changes. Really, you're just kind of saying what you're going to omit. And again, I'm not saying I'm right, I'm just saying that's how I do it. That, that's that's good because everybody does it differently, and I, I know that's something I've always wondered is is how how guys adjust at halftime and how they how do they talk to the kids and all that. Um, last question before you go, nothing football related. I know you're a big Office guy, like I am. Hey, who's your favorite character? Uh, why? Maybe go favorite episode too, if you can. 
Okay, so favorite character is a wussy answer. It's Michael. Uh, you know, he's the glue that holds the whole thing together. And he's yeah. the catalyst for all the very good interaction. Keep Michael, Steve Carell, when he plays Michael Scott, is the only character I've ever seen that can, like, you can, like, in a 22-minute episode, you can, like, feel bad for him, love him, hate him, and be embarrassed by him all the exact same episode. So I think that's incredible. I will say this, a very unpopular opinion of what I'm about to say. I think the most underappreciated character is Gabe from the very end of the show, the big... You like that douchebag? <laughs> Dude, my wife thinks I'm a crazy person because I, I think everything that guy does is absolutely hilarious. He was really? a very good addition to the show. And when you go back and you rewatch all the subtle stuff he does, man, that guy is gold. Really? I'll have to pay um, attention more because I don't pay attention to him at all because I don't know why I hate oh, him. He's, most pe- most people aren't even indifferent. Most people absolutely hate him. Yeah. But he, I think he's the most underrated character in the whole series. And then uh, favorite episode by far is uh, Casino Night at the end where uh, Jim and Pam finally come to a head of That's like good. a meaningful actual relationship. At the same time, Michael has two dates to the same. Co- yeah, that's right. You can't figure out what to do. And like one is so meticulously, you're like deeply invested in it, so well thought out. And the other one's just a complete dumpster fire mess. Uh, <laughs> it's just all, the whole thing's very funny. I think, and Steve Carell actually, I think wrote and directed that episode. Oh, did he? But it's, I, thought, I thought that was a very, very poignant moment in the whole show. That was really just, I thought, I think, well, well done. Kind of like how Seinfeld used to do the three or four different storylines at the beginning that always seemed totally opposite, but they'd always connect by the end of the show. Right. Uh, I thought that was really well done. I love in, the, in that casino night how Dwight's the middleman between both women in that episode, and he's got to communicate to <laughs> on what happen, what's happening in that situation. I don't know why, though. My- oh, Character, I love them. I, I love Kevin. I don't know. I, I think he's got the best one-liners in the show, and I think he is so underappreciated in the show. Kevin's incredible. He does a great job. I mean, all the all the auxiliary characters are so critical. Right. For you go with Andy, you go from hating him to liking him to hating him. Just uh, it was just it was really really well done. You know, you can't have. You know, Jim and Dwight are kind of like Batman and Joker. Like, you have to have them to, right. to balance each other out. And they're yin and yang. And it's just, you know, Stanley's awesome. Phyllis is weird. <laughs> just, even even Ryan. Ryan and Kelly are a good component of that show. Yeah. I mean, it's, there's, everyone's an all the characters are so good. Right. Yeah, well, dude, I appreciate you. You did a hell of a job tonight. I appreciate you. I'm going to – I'll put it up um, probably tonight or tomorrow morning, so – it should go well. I appreciate it, man. A lot of the a lot of coaches reached out to me and and were excited to hear you. So I appreciate you getting on and and helping the uh, coaching community out, man. Dude, this is awesome. I appreciate it. This is cool. This is like this is by far is the questions that you had me answer. That that's by far the the best set of questions I've had times ten. Like that's extremely well thought out, and like you get actual answers. Like I don't get asked that stuff very often, but I I do think there's I'm just convinced in football. It has nothing to do with what you do. It's all about how. Right. I think that is absolutely critical. Dude, I really appreciate it, man. Good luck this year. Yeah, man, I appreciate the time. All right, man. See you, man. All right, man. Take it easy. Bye.